Hello YouTube land, this is Brenton Son coming to you from Lexington, Kentucky, the Bluegrass State. Today we have um, a guest who is going to be sharing uh, some Dogman stories and a extra story at the end that I think is really cool. You should stick around and listen to this one. It's a bonus story, we'll call it. Um, very interesting and uh, um I don't want to give it away, but it's a, it's a very awesome story at the very end. But uh, anyway, um, this fellow uh, emailed me a while back, and uh, and I've been wanting to speak with him because he's local, and I'm going to call him Mr. Kentucky because he's from Kentucky. But before we get started, if anyone out there has a story they'd like to share, whether it be Dogman or Bigfoot or any kind of other cryptid or paranormal, supernatural, any kind of interesting mystery, you can contact me at brentonson at gmail.com and give me a brief description of what your story is and uh, contact information. Um, from there, if anyone wants to contribute to help me get this studio uh, lined out and help me with this show, uh, you can go to a link in the description. Uh, it's PayPal me. It's super easy to use, and I appreciate every contribution that I have received. But let's just go on to our guest here. We're going to use Mr. Kentucky uh, to give as much of an introduction for yourself as you would like to, and then just go ahead and tell your first story, and then I'll ask you questions at the end of that story, please. Okay. Well, thanks, Brenton, for having me, first of all, and thanks for what you do for uh, bringing to light these kind of encounters. I'm a simple guy. I'm kind of an outdoorsman. I like to fish a lot. Uh, pretty simple, uh, hardworking dad, you know, just a normal guy. And about 10 years ago, uh, with my first encounter, happened. In the Daniel Boone National Forest, um, a friend and I were going catfishing. And we had just got there. We pulled up in a van to a certain spot where we could pull it right up to the water. It was kind of, a, kind of like um, a, a real small pebbles, almost sandy part of the, of the road where it touched the water because the water was up. And um, well, I'd get out excited with my fishing poles. And I set them down, and I was getting some chicken livers on, and I, I hear what sounds like a like something making a, ru a ruckus up in the up in the woods, and it just seemed to be getting louder. Well, we um, my friend was in the still in his vehicle trying to bait up a hook to tie up a hook, and. Uh, he said, he told me to be quiet. He said, do you hear that? And I said, yeah, I hear that. And I noticed that it was getting louder. And he said, it sounds like it's on two feet. And it sounds like it's running right at us. Well, the way the this vehicle was positioned, for me to get in the passenger door, I would have to go around to the side that was closer to where this noise was coming from, which I wasn't prepared to do. Because the hair stood up on my neck when I realized that, like, everything went quiet. It was an experience I'd never had before. And uh, so I, I crawl in the back of the van. Uh, he popped the latch. I crawl in the back of the van up to the uh, passenger seat where we had a mag light. And that's when it happened. I turned the mag light on and scanned about 30 feet away. And I hit something in the eyes that I didn't think was real uh, I, it's been 10 years and I'm still I'm trembling now just thinking about it because you know it just kind of brings it back and I remember hitting it in the eyes with a flashlight and it's something that you don't wish upon anyone to really you know to, to stare in the eyes of something like this at first I thought you know it's a fancy some kind of animatronic mask or you know it's a you know, I, I, everything to deny the truth. And uh, I talked to it. I said, you know, uh, 
you know, you got us, you scared us, now come on down, you know, hoping that it would take the mask off. Uh, the way the bushes were, it was blocking it from waist down. So all I'm seeing is waist up on this thing. But the just the muscles, the the everything, the hair, everything was just too too alive. Uh, so uh, probably one of the longest encounters I think I've heard of anybody having, because it, I mean he and I have talked about it. It was at least three minutes worth of uh, staring this thing in the eye from about thirty feet, and. Uh, we tried to get pictures on cell phones that they they wouldn't come out due to the the night and being inside a vehicle and everything. And uh, he kept telling me to take the flashlight off of it and and scan it back, and maybe it'll move a little bit and we can see the rest of it. And after three minutes, I finally did that, and uh, and when I put it back, it had. It had dropped down. The only place that it could have went was now closer to me. So now yeah, the only choice we had left was to start the van and take off. It was just to get out of there. So we did, and we go back a couple of days later. It happened on a Friday in November in 07, Daniel Boone National Forest, and we went back on Sunday, and we the water had risen a little more, and we walked down there. And there were two game wardens within 10 feet of where we'd seen this thing who escorted us out, who told us a story of a mountain lion and a cub that, it were, that they had on Dash King, I'm drinking from the, that part of the lake, and escorted us out. And that pretty much sums up the first one. Uh, okay. Besides the fear and everything, that's pretty much it. Now, um, can you give us a description of the what the creature looked like? The eyes, the fur, uh, the teeth, uh, anything like that that you saw, and um, and then the uh, game wardens. Um, why do you think that they would be hiding this up? So a description, and then whatever that you think the game warden is thinking uh kind of give us a little bit of a description of you all basically asking did okay. you you because you, you did say something about you um are you because they said it was a bobcat in the area but you were saying mm -hmm. oh, are you really here because of the that thing yeah i i did ask them that and that's when they looked at each other and just escort us out they didn't have anything to say after that they strictly wanted us out of the area right then. And this was broad daylight. And this is, you know, I'd never been, you know, escorted out like that of anywhere before. Um, so that was really unusual to me because I, I'm not a big conspiracy theory, but, you know, uh, you know, an apple's an apple. Um, so... It just, it, it didn't make sense to me, but then it did make sense. The reason, you know, why they were wanting us out of there. And I thought they were maybe holding back a little information. Maybe they just weren't able to tell, but I think they were aware that we knew and why we were there. That's kind of what I took it. And as far as the description goes, if you can imagine, um, I've heard, I, you know, since this, a few years ago, I started, um, researching it quite a bit in books and the internet and everything. And I've found a lot of people's encounters and what did they say it looked like. And one thing it has in common, it did have the yellow eyes and, uh, the eyes were very, just very menacing. Almost, um, uh, like, a, like it had information, you know, like it was trying to, uh, you know, talk to us with its eyes almost, you know, and whether that was get out of here or I'm going to kill you. I mean, it approached way off of a hill, a very tall hill at a rapid speed and tearing up things to, to kind of, uh, you know, to encourage us to leave. Um, and as far as the basic look of it, I mean, the, the tall pointed ears, um, you know, we, 
during that sighting, you know, while we were staring at it, but he and I were talking, you know, trying to talk ourselves out of what we were seeing. And in such a long time to sit and, and focus on it, uh, we we really, the details are, are vivid because it, it was a gray overall appearance like your typical wolf. But it had shoulders like a uh, like a big man, like a like a very big person. Um, but not a whole lot at the neck area, but a lot of, uh, a lot of lighter gray features around the mouth as a, as a dog that's starting to age or a wolf that's starting to age will kind of get that gray, that light gray. It had a lot of that around it. And I noticed some on the chest too. And like I said, I didn't see the legs and I didn't see the hands, but I could see the biceps and, you know, a lot of the features through the hair. With that, with the mag light at 30 feet, kind of penetrating some of the hair because it it wasn't super thick on the underside, you know. It was just really unusual, and its right arm was actually behind a tree. The way that it was standing there, uh, it was right against the tree. So I'm really looking at three quarters of the left arm, and from the midsection up, and the ears were twitching. I mean. That was one thing that really stuck out was the ears twitching. And every now and again, it would kind of go like it was listening to back up the hill. And it never crossed my mind that there could be another one. But, the, I mean, the basic description is pretty pretty general. But as, as looking at pictures I've found over the Internet and other things, you know, certain ones really jump out at me. And, and I kind of relive it again when I see certain pictures. And those, you know. With a memory like this, I found that every now and again, you know, I'll have the real memory comes back. And that's twice as scary as, as the ones that when I just think of it, if that makes any sense. You know, when it really, when it, like when I actually had the, the actual memory in the detail, it was far worse than just if you can imagine a werewolf standing there. It was actually scarier because there was some kind of, uh, I, you know, it was like, I don't know, it was kind of like I was feeling uh, in a, in a fear, a primal fear that I'd never felt. I had never had that, and I'd had some crazy things, but I'd never had anything like, you know, uh, an animal in front of me I couldn't identify. Right. And, it, you know, I it just... <sighs> It's really hard to, to describe it, and I'm not the best artist, but I've seen a lot of pictures that are really close to it. But this thing really looked like it. It looked to me like with the upper body it had that it was bipedal most of the time, just because of the 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 man like appearance it had with the broad shoulders, you know. I'm, it was a big beast. I mean, if I had to guess, I'm going to say 400 pounds at the at the least. And, and at your, the least. And your friend is um, around 6'8", you said, and he went over there and stood in the area that it was at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when we went back, um, when we encountered the game wardens, we kind of were standing there and kind of marking it off and, and trying to look for tracks and stuff when we got escorted out. And my friend, who's 6'6", six, six, stood there, and he was more than a foot underneath of where it was. More than a foot. Over a foot. If not two feet. Well, that's that's a huge animal, then. <laughs> you know, yes, yeah, that's, that's the biggest animal I'd seen at this point, yes. I mean, that, that seems more like about eight foot. I'm going to say it was eight foot. Yeah, it was seven and a half to eight foot at, at the least. Yeah. The bare minimal. But just a very, uh, just a scary animal to look at in the face, if that makes sense. It's just because we're not, I'm not used to seeing a, a wolf stand with such composure. Um, this thing stood there as if that's what it did. And my friend did say, as, as the noise was getting louder, he said, get in the, get in the car because this thing's on two feet. Whatever's coming after us is coming down the hill on two feet. <laughs> Excuse me. All right. So 
that that really stuck out in my mind that you know it, it, he noticed it before I did that this thing was coming down bipedal. I just I've never had that fear. I kind of grew up in the woods and stuff, and this changed all that. Now knowing what's out there, especially here in my area where I've lived ninety percent of my life. Uh, it, it's changed a lot. I'm not, it's not that I'm terrified. It's that I think I, now that I know well, these certain areas, I won't visit again. Uh, now, when yeah. it, when you had the flashlight on it, it stood there with the ears twitching and what have you. Um, and it didn't want to move until basically, um, uh, you moved the light, so that kind of uh, seems to me that it wanted to stay perfectly still to make possibly you weren't seeing it because a lot of times with the Bigfoot encounters, the uh, Dogman encounters, if they stand still, people will walk right by them. And um, the fact that it waited till you moved the light that that implies to me that he wasn't sure. If exactly or it was just instinct when a human's looking in their direction to stand still do you think so yes uh -huh. that's that's i mean he didn't move his composure was perfect for when i hit him with the light and after about three minutes we've guessed that it to be at least three minutes of staring at it when i moved the light like my friend kept suggesting which i was afraid to do because i'm i'm the one closer to it <laughs> uh but when i did yeah, it, it 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 had to have dropped down. I have a clear view of everything behind it and on up the, the hill. The only place that I can't see is a small ditch between me and this thing. And that's the only place. It either vanished into the air or it fell on all fours and is now 10 feet from us. The and it was like the, the it was it was like it got scarier when it disappeared. And that's when we put it in reverse. And we back straight out of this this area. So, how far away was it from you? It was thirty feet with the flashlight in its eyes when it disappeared, or when it. I mean, the only place that it that it could have gone was a small, like laurel thicket um, that was about ten feet from me. So it could have been maybe twelve, thirteen feet right on the other side of that thicket, and it was a gully enough to hide an animal, you know, a little ditch big enough to hide an animal of that size. And it, I don't know if you've shined a, a mag light through a through a thicket bush before at night, but you can't see the other side. You know, it's uh, everything looks like a shadow on the other side. So, yeah, at that point. You know, we were both, uh, I don't even think we said anything. We just put it in reverse and, and left, and I don't think we talked the entire ride home. Did you think maybe that there was a, another one, and it was being a decoy, buying time, or allowing another one to sneak up, or wanting to get away, or something like that? That's a good possibility. You know, at the time, no, it was so overwhelming to see this. Uh, that once that primal fear set in, I didn't even think about another one being there. And this being the animal that I, that I looked at, I don't think it needed another one for just two people. Uh, you know, if it was going to do damage, I, I felt like it really it could have flipped uh, the vehicle in the water. It just looked like it could, uh, just especially that wild animal uh, strength that they have. I can just imagine that it could have done enough damage by itself. But no, at the time, I didn't think that it was using any strategy to get closer or to get another one in or anything like that. It was just, uh, we knew to leave at that point when it, when it apparently dropped behind that, that thicket that it had only gotten closer. And at 30 feet, when you see something like this, the last thing you want is it to get any closer. All right. Wow, that's a that's a fascinating encounter, and it, uh, three minutes is a really long time to have an encounter. They typically don't last that long. Um, and the area that you had the encounter, I noticed that um, I've heard of other encounters 
in that direction at least on the northern end of Daniel Boone National Park. The Bigfoot encounters a lot of times I hear about in the southern end um, toward Tennessee. And then Kurt Stokes had an encounter, uh, Taylorsville Lake, which is a little bit um, west of that, but in north, you know, uh, in, in Kentucky. Um, it seems to me that the uh, dogmen hang out kind of in the north end, because even when you go to LBL, in between the lakes, the dogmen tend to be in the northern end of LBL. Do you? Uh, That's think, what I've heard. Yeah, do you think that the dogmen uh, um, are basically sticking to to the northern regions a little bit more it's you know that's a good good point and yeah it seems to be that way i mean if whether they're coming down from uh, you know bray road and or wherever you know it seems that they that around here that they've come from the north because even a few years ago you know, i'd read that there was a, a cemetery in the town of ashland that even a couple police officers had an encounter with a werewolf around a cemetery up there. And I guess that that's north of here, a little northeast, but on the northern side. And I guess most of them have been. And in that same area um, from where I had my encounter, it was about three years after my encounter, I picked up a book about mysteries in Kentucky. And uh, there was a chapter in the book called Barilla. And uh, it was about... Uh, uh, a sighting in the exact same area in the same month in November in 07 when I had my encounter. So when I read that in that book, the hair stood up on my neck and I called my friend who had the encounter with me and I read him that chapter. And he was at a loss for words also. I like, you know, it validated we weren't crazy because there were a couple other sightings, you know, some incredible people as well. And, you know, it just, uh, it made me think, wow, you know, I'm not crazy. Cause if he hadn't have been with me, I wouldn't be telling my story right now. I would have chalked it up to, you know, I, I spooked myself or something, you know? Uh, but the fact that, you know, it took him or my friend a long time to, to talk about it, even to, to mention it to me until recently. And just says, yeah, I saw what you saw. And, you know, how else can you talk about something like that? That people think you're crazy. Right. And, and so, so, so that, know, that author, he, he was calling these things bear Um Probably, do you think he was calling it that because a bear has a little bit of a snout and they're trying to keep it in the Bigfoot genre, but people are actually reporting seeing a werewolf or a dog man? That's, I have to agree with you, yeah. That's kind of the way I stand on it, personally, um, that Yes, that a lot of people that are reporting, you know, Bigfoot are just, I'm sure, I feel like a bunch of them are probably these dogman things because it's the only thing I've had an encounter. I'm not saying that Bigfoot's not out there by no means. I, you've told me your encounter, and I know other people have seen them. I just feel like these dogmen almost, get misidentified as Bigfoot more often than not. And yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an unusual topic. And that, that probably is why they're called, you know, bear is anything but werewolf. Who wants to hear werewolf? Right. I, I think that, uh, I think that a lot of the researchers in the beginning were whenever someone reported dog man, they were, you know, uh, writing it up as a Bigfoot, and then they was finally able to kind of morph it and say, well, it had a snout, so they're trying to make it into a Bigfoot with a snout, and then they call it Barilla. When in the cases that I've heard, it, the the people were actually saying they saw a werewolf, and the, but the researcher writes it up uh, to fit what he uh, feels comfortable reporting, and I'm not saying mm -hmm. that's always the case, but that's a very odd situation. And and, and that guy told you about other encounters too, didn't he? Yes, I was. Uh, I don't want to bring his name up, but he's a 
a crypto guy here in the local area that I'd spoke to a couple of years ago who had told me a lot of things I didn't know and was unaware of as far as the Native American um, coincidences that kind of go in with it and um, some other local stories. Um, now, I don't have a way to validate these, but um, I'd heard about an autistic kid that lived uh, in the Bourbon County area um, on the east side of Bourbon County um, who had uh, been attacked by one. Uh, and lived through it, along with a squirrel hunter whose friends uh, went to see him in the hospital, and he described what attacked him, and they went after it, and they tracked it all through the night with dogs and cornered it in a barn, and it supposedly, just in the daylight, the dogs weren't finally weren't afraid to go on in the barn, and it was no longer there. They found claw marks in the barn and so on, but it, it had vanished on them. So yeah, this little that that area kind of had a few hits, along with uh, with my second sighting was in that area. Okay, if you would go ahead and tell that uh, second sighting. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, my second sighting was um, right close to Bourbon County, uh, and the Montgomery County line, and. Uh, I have a camper. It's on a private piece of uh, land, small farm, um, and I think it, they're called greenways, where the where the woods kind of extend in through uh, less wooded areas where where animals will use as a highway. And a friend of mine, game warden, had told me he'd seen a bear, and I'd had other people that had told me uh, that actual a news channel, a local news channel, had pulled onto my property and shot footage of a bear in 2015, in July. I never looked into it to see if it was true, but this is what I was told was that they had uh, saw a sow and a, and a cub coming across my property, which the game warden, when he told me, I pretty much believed him. He said he'd seen a very, very big black bear come through there, which is kind of rare. But something had been destroying my garden every year, and I did find unusual tracks. <laughs> so one night, uh, I'm in my camper with a friend, and uh, it's probably, I don't know, 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning, and I was beat. And I was I, My day was done, and I'd laid down in the camper. And uh, my friend was still was having a couple beers and uh, calling me a party pooper. And, uh, I can see the firelight um, out the uh, the plastic windows of a camper, of my camper. And uh, she says, you're boring. I'm going to go back out here and sit by the fire or something of that nature. And as she was saying that, uh, something, something that resembled a wolf standing upright was in between the fire and the camper. And... Uh, she was going for the door as I see this thing's head turn towards the camper door. And, uh, the only thing I could do was jump up and get between her and the door. I knew if I told her what it was, it, you know, she was going to run out there and not believe me. And uh, the way I thought at the time get killed. And really that's the extent of it is I didn't let her go outside for a while. And, uh, I didn't see it anymore. It dropped down on all fours. And I didn't see it anymore. Uh, but later on, we did find a weird track. We found one, like a wolf track, but a little bigger, uh, in, in my creek. But it, only one print, which I'd never seen, you know, which told me that it was walking uh, back into the thicket. Uh, yeah, so I didn't, you know, I, did I see that animal or just its shadow? I think I just saw the, the what it was, the shadow that it was giving on the, the side of the camper. But it was definitely a, I mean, unless somebody had a seven-foot German shepherd close by that could walk on its hind legs that, you know, that was standing there, then it was a second dog man encounter. Uh, I was too afraid to come out of the camper after that until morning. All right. Yeah, that, that uh, I mean, that that's interesting because... You know, you you know when you see something walking upright, 
and it has a shadow that's a dog's head. Um, I mean, you know, come on, that's <laughs> that's uh, yeah, it, especially it since unusual. you you'd already seen one before, so that it was not a hard thing for you to um, kind of recollect and uh, piece that together and know what you'd saw. Exactly. And I was always afraid that they were going to find my secret spot. You know, I kind of worried that because from what I've heard, you know, people seem to have a second encounter and I kept praying that that wasn't going to happen. And, uh, you know, it, well, at least I didn't, you know, I, I didn't see it, you know, I only saw the shadow. So that wasn't as bad as actually the first one. But it was bad because its attention was on the camper and it was standing there in front of the fire, which was pretty, pretty creepy. You know, seeing it between you and a, a very big fire I had burning. Um, how far yeah, away, yeah. how, how far away was the, that encounter from your first one? In miles, I'm going to say 35 miles. Well, you're still in the home territory of what they would roam then, so that's not uh, nothing too terribly unusual. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah it, I mean, that might be why people have more than one encounter, because they, they have a population of them around, uh, and they have them in the same area, typically. Um, from, from there, now you had another encounter. Um, and this one I think is just fascinating um, with uh, yeah. your dog and the little pig. Would you, would you tell that one? Yes. <laughs> so me and uh, my girlfriend and my our pet pig and our little pet dog, we were down the farm, the same place, and this is probably two years after that encounter, the one I just told. This is two years later, same place. Um, we're down here. It's uh, we actually went down and we we kind of had we grew uh, some vegetables just for our pig and let him go down just to let him forage around and it was just a good place for us to go and get out of the town and uh, and to check on our garden and we're down there and I was actually digging in a creek gonna gonna pond it up and. Uh, it's getting dark, and, and the area that I'm at is a, uh, a property fence, actually, which leads to another farm, which is uh, totally uninhabited and all grown up, and there's actually a dead patch in that area. About 150 feet from where I, I'm at currently, there's a dead spot in the woods where nothing, where everything's dead. And uh, just an unusual, dark little patch of woods, probably 15 acres or something, you know. Just a creepy little patch of woods. And uh, well, I'm digging, and uh, my pig was on one side of me and my dog on the other. And my pig whimpered, and he took off, and he runs, and he gets under the truck, which was about mm, 60 or 70 feet away. And it was probably 10 feet from the, from the garden. And... Uh, then my fiance not or my fiance notices that the pig is scared and tells me that hey it's time to go something's not right pig doesn't do this. She opened the door and the pig gets in the truck and puts its head under the seat like he's hiding his face and doesn't want to see. So what she's telling me is I'm digging and I'm paying no mind to it and my little dog starts growling and he's growling and I'm and it's not dark yet but it's dark in this patch of woods that I'm literally 10 feet from and uh, I you know I quit digging for a minute and I'm looking I don't see anything and my dog's still growling it's unlike him to do this or the pig well it's getting darker with each, each second and she's telling me to come on it's time to go and as I, as I started to, my dog pounced over the creek, and literally 15 feet from me, he is growling and snapping at something. Now, I didn't get to see what it was, and it's almost completely black in there where he just dove into. And I can't see what he's, what he's fighting with, and then he comes yelping. I mean, this the whole thing didn't last maybe 
probably five seconds of him barking and yelping, and he comes flying back. And uh, he gets under the truck. She opens the door. He jumps up in there, and he's he's livid. He's wanting his. I felt like he was trying to make sure I was okay. Well, I just had this terrible feeling. So I go get in in the car or in the truck, and I pull off and drive away about 150 feet up on a little knoll because I wanted to turn around and get my headlights on to see what just happened, what kind of creature I'm dealing with. We pull up there on this little knoll, and I put it in park for a second, and my dog is snapping at the back glass. Like whatever it was is now has followed us up the knoll and is behind the vehicle. And it was honestly one of those moments where you're almost too afraid to look because the way the dog's acting, you don't want to see what he's barking at, you know, what he's yapping at. I'm not trying to sensationalize the story. I'm just saying it really felt, I felt like there was something there that I didn't want to see, having seen what I have seen. I wasn't ready to see anything else, but he was literally nose on the glass, teeth on the glass, protecting his owners from something that had followed us up the hill. And I could not think of one animal that will follow me up the hill unless it's a, you know, well, domestic. You, well, your, your, um, your girlfriend or your wife or whoever, or your woman there said that yep. she felt like something slammed into the car. Oh, and- yes, yes, yes. Yes. She did say that the car had rocked. Yes. And uh, I guess as I was, I, I had turned around to see, and just, you can't see, I mean, especially with your, I guess I had the parking lights on there, and it's behind us, and it's just, I can't see more than a foot behind the truck. And uh, she said she felt like it would, you know, like something had rocked the truck as soon as we got where we were at, you know, and that was, that was pretty creepy, but uh, I had a, a bed light, and uh when I put it in park and it, you know, it just lit up the bed, but I, there was nothing in the bed at that time, but just very unusual. Let me say the least. It was very unusual for my dog to be snapping well, at I, the glass like this. Yeah. I'm kind of wondering, uh, because I can see the dog barking and stuff, but I'm wondering if it had jumped in the truck in the back of the truck and was headed, it was right up to the glass, and it was biting, and it maybe jumped out or something before you were, you had looked, because you That's, said you didn't want to look, but, you know. Yeah, and I didn't. I didn't look until, you know, I mean, I really had to build up the courage to turn around and look out the window, and I remember uh, my fiance was the same way. It was like we didn't want to turn around. You ever just that instinct of don't turn around. It was creepy, very creepy. Just that, you know, that that kind of feeling. And I'm not a guy that had ever shied out in the woods. When I was a child growing up, I would come in from school and go to the woods. You know, I've just, I've, I've always been in the woods, a fisherman, the husband, and, you know, that's just what I've done. And uh, that's all changed a little bit. Um, just as far as what I know is out there, what I have seen. Yeah, I know. And I just um, want to alert people that I don't know if it's just these days that have changed or if something's been released or or what it is, but there's it seems to definitely be on the rise of this type of uh, encounter with people. And I, I encourage people to, to come forward with it if they have seen this thing. Yeah. Yeah, I know. That, that's... Uh... I know that there's been a lot of stories from way back, but it seems to me um, maybe more people are coming forward, but it also seems like the population of them are growing um, more. And some people think, well, you know, that people just called it other things. And and that is true on Bigfoot and stuff. But uh, I think the dog man thing has become more prevalent. And I think the uh, Bigfoot population is springing back from the time when uh, when people immigrated to this country and started establishing colonies, you know, for, for you know, Britain and what have you. We brought disease. It wiped out, you know, it wiped out a lot of Indians uh, 
in the country, and I bet you that it had the same effect on the Bigfoot population and possibly the Dogman population, and it's just now getting to a point where they're springing back into huge populations, and because I'm getting so many reports, and they're not even really far away from people. Um, many times they're living on the edges of towns or and also out in the wilderness, but when, you know, a lot of people think, well, they're, we're encroaching on their habitat and, and uh, there's not that much woods. That's not true. Get on Google Earth and look how many wildlife refuges there are that are federal controlled yep. and even state parks. But I think the federal government knows these things are out there. So they have to reserve these vast, like uh, the area that you had the encounters in, Daniel Boone National Park was where Cape Run is. And, and uh, it mm -hmm. runs all the way through the state from up in um, Ohio, all the way down through Kentucky into Tennessee. Uh, places like Utah, where I'm getting, uh, I get a lot of uh, um, stories from there, that it's uh, unbelievable how much of that state is uh um, wildlife refuge and uh, uh, federal parks and and you know you can get online and you can look and they're everywhere there's lots and lots and lots of woods still out there for these things to be and I, and they seem to be coming to the edges of these woods and being opportunistic and and um, watching almost as if they're doing recon on people and uh yeah, that's, you know, very yeah. fascinating. Um, that's one of the reasons I search these mysteries out, trying to see if we can come up with some answers. And and um, but they did I appreciate call, the work. You, you know, they used to call them chicken man, wild man. You, you look back into newspaper articles back in 1800s and and, uh, you know, even before, really. And and you'll find that they'll have hairy man or wild man. Uh, you know, encounter ball, you know, <laughs> they, they had one that was uh, the Native Americans actually went to, um, it seemed like it was like they went to court to say these are a, a people um, because they were getting a pot, you know, the white guys, was, white man was getting a posse and going to go hunt the, you know, some of these things down and, and uh, you know, so, so they've been around, but it, it seems like there's more and um, I don't remember seeing any articles of these dogman creatures. Not saying there wasn't some. Uh, maybe they were, since they were bipedal, had hands and arms and stuff, they were calling them wild men also. Um, right. You know. <laughs> yeah. And I started looking into the, the history of Kentucky and the encounters of these things after my experience, my first experience. And uh, one of the first pages that popped up was like uh, the Gateway Werewolf, you know, and then. I guess it was uh, 2012, the the Wadi Werewolf, and uh, I'd actually spoke to some locals up there, brothers, and one believed and one didn't. So it's kind of a mixed bag up there. But, um, you know, it, the, that's one thing about doing this kind of research and looking and trying to figure out some answers is that, you know, it, the way that it states, you know, the, the Gateway Werewolf, you know, Kentucky's long history with the Gateway Werewolf in this area. Uh, well, I couldn't find anything else on it, you know. Um, like, I'd like to know where those references are coming from um, as to what, you know, who else. But the, when you talk to a couple or one crypto person in particular that I spoke to acted like it was just a well-known fact and that they were more aggressive than Bigfoot and, uh, to leave as soon as you see it was his advice. If you see one, just just get out of there, which uh, is a natural instinct when you're not the uh, alpha. You know, so you don't need to hang around. See what happens when you're looking at something that's born to kill. It's, um, uh, and it's I, an easy thing. They, that they used to call them, even overseas and stuff, like in India and places like that, they had... Uh, um, they, they basically call them xenocephali. Um, they're, they were dog headed people, but those seem to have like regular legs, not with, not with the hawks, you know, like we see today. Um, and they traded with, uh, with, uh, people, um, they were said not to really speak. They yelped and 
uh, and, and, you know, made little barking and yelping type noises to communicate. And kings would even give them tribute uh, to not attack them or sometimes pay them big uh, tributes to go and fight for them. They would hire them, hire them as mercenaries. They were said to be silk weavers. Um, when you look at that uh, Sri Lanka land bridge uh, story, uh, they talk about the monkey people, but in some of the iconography and the uh, paintings and stuff like that that depict that, it has these monkey, Bigfoot-looking creatures, but also it has these dog-headed creatures. So it makes me wonder if there used to be more tribes of them and something happened where it knocked them down. And, uh, I mean, I don't know. It's it's fascinating, but... Even some of the depictions of like Saint Christopher and and and, and uh, different things like that would show um, some of these people with a dog head and a halo around their um, around their head, and it makes you wonder, yeah, well, what does that mean? You know? <laughs> yes, I have. I've I've looked and read all that, and it's it, it just brings me to more questions than anything because. Um, you know, like uh, Linda Godfrey said, if you did find uh, evidence, you know, if you found a dead one, you know, he's not going to be too different than just a big wolf for the most part. Uh, if you, unless you looked at it. I mean, if you got up on it, it was a broad shouldered eight footer, like my first encounter. Yeah, it's definitely not a wolf. And anybody would know that upon inspection. But at the same time, you know how fast animals just evaporate into a forest once they decay i mean it, you know any any woods is just going to eat the bones away uh, pretty rapidly but like you said i mean every culture has had these things and i guess we all just think it's a myth most people just think it's some kind of myth that these things are out there and uh, i just you know, I, the reason I contacted you was really I had thought for a couple of years about talking to somebody. And I know there's a lot of shows, but you were local and you you have a biblical overview, which I respect. And and when, you know, getting to talk to you, I thought you were a really nice guy and thought for sure that I'd rather uh, do it here. That way, um, maybe somebody else in this area will come forward and, and say, because, I, you know, like, I mean, there was two of us the first encounter I had. But my friend, there's no way, there's no amount of money that would get him to come forward uh, to admit what he saw. Right. Um, and you know, just the kind of person he is. And it's, there's no way. You know, if you ever talked to him and, and, uh, and you mentioned that you came on and shared the story, you can tell him. It's like, look, you can remain anonymous. Um, you don't have to give your name and, you know, I can alter your voice and, uh, you know, you don't have to give away who you are, but, but letting people know that these things are out there because there's a lot of people come up missing every year in these state parks and it's not just getting lost. Uh, there's, you know, the 411 books that kind of shed a lot of light on that and the amount of people uh, coming up missing. And, and I interviewed a game warden and basically one of the reasons that's not public is because that what they do is even when uh david pilates went to these uh park services and what have you and, and asked them about missing people reports they said they didn't have any and he said i know you darn sure do and what they do is they don't close the case and in any kind of criminal case or a, an investigative uh, case is being investigated as long as the case is open and the investigation is ongoing they cannot share the information with the public. And so that's that's how they do that. Um, you, have sure. one, you have one more story that uh, I thought was just awesome um, because we kind of got to talking and somehow we got off on the, this, uh, this other topic. And, uh, and it's one of those good stories to, to, you know, if someone's listening to this at nighttime and a lot of people tell me, I listen to this when I go to bed. Um, this will be a good one for you to fall asleep after you've heard this uh, last part. You won't dream of dog man. <laughs> so if you would, uh, buddy, uh, you, uh, tell this last story, please. Sure. Okay. Um, 
I was working in Texas and, uh, me and a friend, uh, was riding with me and my boss, uh, the foreman on the job was, uh, in front of us and we were traveling to Salt Lake city and, uh, we left Houston on a Friday to get to Salt Lake by Monday morning to start a new job. And of course we had drove, I couldn't tell you how many miles, but way too many miles. Um, that Friday we got off early and drove until early Saturday morning. And, uh, my boss in front of us was, uh, as we had made it into New Mexico, he was, uh, he was weaving and, um, due to uh the fatigue and the just the, we were just i had called him and was begging him to pull over and you know next next hotel next anything we got to sleep at the time to sleep well we were speeding which we shouldn't have been doing in the first place but we were trying to cover ground this was uh, 15 years ago um well he was swerving and uh you could see a car coming from a few miles out and, um, you know, in the desert, we would pass a car maybe every hour, or every two hours or something. And, uh, it's on interstate 40, um, we're 35 miles outside of Clayton. Um, I was about 150 feet, maybe 200 feet behind, um, my foreman as, uh, and sure enough, uh, this first pair of headlights in forever that were coming, um, Lee happened to, or my, my, excuse me, my boss happened to, uh, to weave over and, uh, hit him head on at 80 mile an hour in a full size Chevrolet truck with about 2,000 pounds of tool in the back of the truck with a camper top on it. Well, the other vehicle was a suburban full size. And, uh, when they hit, it was like a, a bomb went off. And, uh, I drove through the smoke and instantly it had that car wreck smell. And, uh, I ran up to the vehicle. It was a terrible, terrible head on collision. I ran up to, to, uh, my boss's truck and he still got his seatbelt on. He's still in position, but the dashboard is inside of his legs and, uh, uh, used a little knife that we used in that field of work, uh, to, to cut his seat belt off. And I had crawled in the passenger door. The driver door wouldn't open. Uh, my friend that was with me, uh, stayed with him while I ran to check on the other vehicle. And, uh, the other vehicle had a man, a woman, and about a 10 or 11 year old girl. And they were all banged up pretty bad. I got them out and uh, laid them together, and they were okay, but they were banged up very bad. <clears throat> and uh, I guess I had ran back to Lee, uh, something I didn't tell you. Brenton was the, the, the truck was on fire. Uh, his, his truck was on fire, and he's trapped inside. And I, I guess I was praying as I was running. Uh, I may have prayed right when it happened, or I may have been praying the whole time. I'm not for sure, but I, as soon as I get back over to Lee, um, he had taken uh, that knife that he used to cut the seatbelt off of him, and when he saw that we couldn't get the door off and couldn't get the dash out of him, um, he had started stabbing himself to cut his leg off. Well, my other friend was standing in the driver's side window. I was crawled up in there with him and trying to peel the dash off of him. And, uh, the vehicle was on fire and, uh, I see my friend out the window, look back towards the road and, uh, I take it there have been no cars here. I did call 911 as soon as it happened, but, uh, there were no other vehicles here. You could see them coming for eight miles out. <clears throat> well, I look up and here comes this man that was every bit of six foot eight a black man in the cleanest pinstripe suit I'd ever seen in my life. And I thought, I mean, just the first thing, the first impression was just, thank God you're here. Um, I didn't know this man. And when he came over as uh, my boss was in the truck, still trying to stab himself and his adrenaline and the shock going, 
while he was stabbing himself, I had a hold of his arm, but he was throwing me around like a rag doll uh, as he was stabbing himself. And when this gentleman put his hand on my boss, he quit. And that that was the most overwhelming uh, piece I think I'm, I probably ever had was at that moment. And uh, he sat there with us. Um, and I, I, you know, in those kind of moments, I don't remember what all was said. The only thing I really remember was that everything's going to be okay. That still resonates with me. And uh, so my boss, uh, finally the ambulance gets there. And the police were there, and uh, my my boss wanted me to ride an ambulance back to this town with him to the hospital. When they got the jaws of life, sorry, I'm a terrible uh, storyteller, but the jaws of life when they when they got there were able to get him out, and they got him on a gurney and got him loaded. Well, the ambulance driver and the police had stepped up over to the ambulance and were asking me uh, who my friend was in the suit, and uh, did he want to ride with us or was he going to ride back with uh, my other friend? And uh, and this had literally been maybe a minute. From uh, from them unlo- you know, getting him out of the vehicle. Uh, so, as we turned the ambulance around to head back to this town, um, everybody was amazed that uh, the man in the suit was gone. Uh, the man in the pinstripe suit, he uh, he really saved the day. He, he was able to calm my friend who was about to be burned alive. Um, he was able to calm him down to where he was actually smiling. And uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, and did and he, that's it. I mean, really. Did he go over, he went over, well, the other people were kind of in shock and then kind of uh, not really moving around or anything. It was kind of like they were out of it. He, uh, he, You said he went over there. He touched them also. He touched your boss. He did. And your boss is sitting there trying to cut his leg off. Yeah, he he was stabbing himself, and as I'm trying to hold him back, he was throwing me like a rag doll. And when he touched him, it was he, he quit. I was able to get the knife back, and uh, he said uh, everything's going to be okay. And he went to the other vehicle. And I don't. And that's just the part. Is that there's no. There was no ending. No, we didn't see him exit. We didn't see how he got there, and it made no sense when we, uh, you know, when the ambulance turned in a 360 angle, and we were able to see all the desert in every direction. And this man was no longer with us. It was uh, unbelievable. Yeah. I felt um, like, you know, um, how could anyone doubt prayer works? How could anyone doubt that? Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's what that's what we were talking about. I'd mentioned an angel story to you, and and you had brought that up, and uh, and basically this guy pops up out of the desert. You know, you're out, you're out yeah. in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the desert, thirty five miles away from a town. He pops up when you start praying. He pops up, basically, and um, comes over there, says everything's going to be all right. Your boss is in a vehicle that's on fire. His legs are stuck in the dash, and he's trying to cut his leg off. And he touches your boss. He calms down, and it's fine. Immediately. Yeah, and then he calms the other group of people down, and then he, you all look off, and he disappears. Out yeah, of it was hand. like we turned around. After I got an ambulance, I turned around to look at him, and he was nowhere, and it made no sense. Yeah. But it made all the sense in the world. You know, it, it, you can entertain angels unaware, and uh, they'll appear, you know, in in whatever form, you know, is appropriate. But you can you can you explain what you what when you saw this man? Uh, you 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 talked about his suit and him being because uh, a lot most of the time when you see an angel, they're beautiful. Yeah, I know. That's one thing I can say. With uh, <laughs> this man was uh, more handsome than than any man that could walk up to you in the desert. 
uh, at two or three in the morning like that at a uh, crash site, uh, the dusty desert, I mean, and walk up in a clean suit, I mean, and look, I mean, it just was amazing. It really was amazing. It was kind of, a, you know, both of our mouths kind of open like, wow. You know? And we just knew he was there to help. I mean, it, it just uh, it was unspoken, you know. It was, um, it was, uh, you know, it just all happened so fast that it, it didn't make any sense. I do remember that the whole entire time there was not another vehicle to come down that road from the time that we sat there until we left in the ambulance. Uh, there was not another vehicle that passed, you know, through that area on the interstate. Because I mean, I guess because of the time, and everything. But because you know, in hindsight, I'm thinking, how did he get there, and how did he leave, and those uh, aren't. Those are, I, I can't answer them. I, I really can't, and uh, I don't need an answer because my friend turned out to be okay. I mean, he he uh, will no longer walk again, but he is alive. Yeah, it, you know, whenever these angels show up, typically they they show up, they have a presence about them, and they walk straight to what they're going to do. They have a sense of purpose. Uh, Absolutely. And, and they're they're immaculately put together. They're, 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 I mean, they can show up in rags or something, but uh, typically they're, they're, there's something about them that is charismatic and uh, beautiful, and, and when they walk, you can tell they're walking with a sense of purpose, like they're going to do something. And uh, it's quite incredible. Um, uh, it was. I mean, honestly, when we looked up and saw him coming, that's the, that's exactly what it was. He was he had a purpose. He was not going to stop until he got to lead to uh, my boss. And well, as soon as he got to him, just how everything had changed was a, a miracle in itself. Yeah. How, how this the situation was no longer tragic yeah it was well, going to be okay yeah and, and and i tell you uh your your prayers that was a faith building thing for you too um because when you when you pray um stuff happens like we we were talking about that earlier that effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much and um and here you are you you were uh your boss you you cared about you know and and these other people you, you cared about what was going on so you definitely gave an effectual and you were and it was a desperate situation so it was a fervent prayer and um and then the word says uh, it, it availeth much we were talking about that word availeth is dudamos in the greek it's the where we get the word dynamite from it, it's a very powerful thing when you pray a prayer like that and as soon as you prayed, you released that help that was was willing and waiting. Um, but I think a lot of times God can't move unless we ask because we have dominion, you know, and, and, uh, and it needs we need to ask. You know, the Bible says that you have not because you ask not, you know. And so I, I just yeah. thought that was a beautiful story. Um, and it shows how God is there many times and willing to help in a very bad situation um he, he he's he's willing to to uh, uh dispatch that angel was sitting there already waiting and i'd say that god even gave you the unction he he uh by his holy spirit he gave you the urge to pray at the right moment and then he already had the answer so uh, that's I, I just think that's uh, absolutely beautiful well, thank you for coming and sharing your stories. Uh, I, I appreciate it, and I hope that it helps other people who've had dogman encounters in this area, or even good angel stories, uh, um, come forward and share. Um, really, would like to uh, put together more encounters from this area, and really any area. But um, it, it's it's nice to get the Kentucky ones for sure. So, thank you very much for coming forward and telling your story well thank you Brendan, for having me and i've, I've enjoyed uh, listening to your show and uh i just like to say uh thanks for having me and uh and be careful anybody that goes out there and, and goes looking for this kind of stuff i really encourage everyone to 
to really take somebody with you. Um, it's easier to to tell a story when you can when someone else can tell the same story. All right. Well, hang on the line there, and I'll I'll wrap this up. Um, everybody out there in YouTube land, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, some good dog man stories and a good good uh, uh, angel story for you there at the end. I uh, thought you might enjoy. Um, if you have something that you want to share, I'll have my email in the description, brentonson at gmail.com. Um, if you want to contribute, like I said, there's a link in the description, PayPal me. You can uh, go there, and it's easy to use. Uh, until the next time, God bless, and I'll see you on the next video. Bye.